Hey Blender Bob here, welcome to another episode of Ask Blender Bob where you tell me in the comments about some VFX shots that you saw on TV or movies or whatever and you want to know how it's been done and I will try to show you how we can reproduce it the best we can in Blender. Now a few people asked me about stadium crowds, how we can reproduce, how we can fill a stadium full of people, moving people. Well, it's not that complicated and turns out that we just finished a commercial that was using actually the techniques I'm going to show you. So here's the commercial. No matter your background, no matter your status, you know, when you put your cleats on, you grab a ball and you go play and it's something that can just bond a community, bond a group of people over the joy and love of soccer. Now, before I show you how to do it, let me give you a little history course on how to do crowd replication. Probably the oldest method to fill out an area with a crowd is to film groups of people at different places and come them together to fill the entire area. Now, if you have a camera movement, you want to make sure that you use a motion control system so that the camera movement will always be the exact same thing from one take to another. Another common technique is to shoot people on green screen and put them on cards inside the stadium. This technique was used in Rocketman by another vendor. The main issue is that you need to film people in a lot of different angles so that you can cover all the possible point of views. At Real by Fake, we are very familiar with these techniques and we use them all the time. So here you can see some examples of jobs we did in the past. But sometimes you need to push the technique a little bit more. We also used full CG characters to replace crowds. There's a Blender Bob about it, the link is in the description. Here's a good demonstration of the problem you will have with cards. You cannot move the camera too much because otherwise the characters just become flat. And you cannot relight them also, you have to live with the light that you have when you shot the characters. But if you use a 3D crowd, then you can do whatever you want. You can relight it, you can change the mood, you can put spotlights in the crowd if you want. So this is what the scene looks like. I put all the characters as bonding boxes, otherwise it would be way too heavy to handle. The grass was just made with a simple hair system. And for the girls' shadows, since we couldn't get them from the green screen, what we did was to invert the alpha and put them on cards, and the cards just cast the shadow on the ground. But of course, you want to make sure that you select your cards and you make them invisible to the camera. We got a better result using three cards than using just one. And I'm certainly not going to explain to you how the comp was done because it's a little bit complicated. And it's Blender Bob, not Nuke Bob. Okay, now let's talk about the crowd. The first step is to get one vertice per seat. So now I'm just working on a section of the stadium, otherwise it would be too long and too heavy. So I selected two faces and then I went into the select menu and I went select similar perimeter. Perimeter, perimeter, parameter, peri, 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 perimeter, okay, around the, the distance, the, the, the length around the polygon. That's what it is, perimeter, perimeter, per, whatever. Now I can inverse the selection and delete the polygons. After that, I need to select one polygon from the seats and I go select per normal. So now I selected all the polygons that have the same normals and I delete them. Okay, now I select all the polygons and I scale them down to something kind of small like this. And then I need to extrude them. I tried without extruding, but it didn't work well, so you have to do this. Well, in this case, anyway, I had to do it. So I extrude them to get a little box. Then I selected all the vertices, I went into Mesh Cleanup and I did a Merge by Distance. And then by playing with the distance here, you can squish them until you get a single vertex per seat. And this is what we get. We get a bunch of points, one per seat. It's geometry node time. Don't worry, it's not going to be very difficult. Okay, so I created a new geometry node tree. And the first node I'm going to create is Instance on Points. I already put all my monkeys into a collection and I'm going to take this collection that I called crowd and I'm just going to drag it into the script here, right there. And then I can connect this into the instance right there. Okay, so not exactly what we wanted to do. So what I'm going to do is to click on separate children so that this way I will not have all the, uh, the elements on top of each other and I will turn on the pick instance. So it's already better, but now they're not at the right position, and that's because our monkeys were not at the origin. So just press Reset Children, and then you should have all the monkeys the way you wanted them. Well, kind of. Okay, let's troubleshoot this. I'm going to change the scale so we can see better what's going on. I'm not too crazy about the randomness. It doesn't look very random. It is, but you can see some patterns and too many monkeys similar to the other one next to each other. Mm, okay, so we can change that. We're going to create a random value node and we're going to connect it into the instance index. 
And now I can mess around with the min and max until I get the desired look. Now we need to fix the rotations because they're all looking down. So what we want is all of them to look at the same object, which is an empty that I created. I renamed the empty star because it's the star of the show. Okay, I'm gonna drag the empty into the script here. And now I need a position node. So just position right there. The position node we just created represents the position of the monkeys. Then I'm going to create a vector math node. I will change it to subtract and I'm going to connect the position into the first vector and the location into the other vector. I don't know why one is called position and the other one is called location. So what we just did was to create a vector that goes from every monkey to the empty. The last step is to create an align Euler to vector. So what I want to do here is to align the Y vector using the Z axis as a pivot. Then I connect the vector into the vector and the rotation into the rotation. And it doesn't seem to work, they're not oriented properly. And that's because my original stadium came from another software that's using Y up instead of Z up. And you can see that my geometry has a 90 degree rotation on it in X. So all I need to do is to apply the rotations and everything will work. You should always, always, always apply the transformations when you use geometry nodes. So now you can see that if I move the empty, all the heads will follow it. Okay, let me try to explain it a little bit better. So I have an empty. I also have a position node, which represents the position of every monkey in the scene. The vector math node will create a vector that will go from the monkey to the position of the empty. It's just a vector, it didn't orient the monkey yet. That's what the next node is for. So what this node does, it says take the Y axis from the monkey and orient it with the vector that we just created using the Z as a pivot. Okay, maybe this is gonna be easier for you to understand. I am the monkey, okay, and this is my Y axis. This is my Z axis, okay? And we defined a vector already. And what the align Euler vector node, what it does is it says, okay, take the Y axis and align it with that vector using the Z as a pivot point. Get it? That's all it does. It's very simple. Okay, let's keep tweaking it. Now they all have the exact same size, so we're gonna change the scale value. And for that, we're gonna create a random value node that we're gonna connect into the scale. And now you just need to adjust the minimum size and the maximum size for the monkeys. If we look at them from the top view, it's not very nice because they're all perfectly aligned. So we're gonna fix that. We're going to create two random value nodes. Then I'm going to create a vector math node. Oh, I forgot I need to change the random value nodes from minus one to one because I want them to move in both directions, back and forth. I will change this here to scale and I will connect the value to the vector. I will duplicate this node here, do the same thing at the bottom here. Cool. Let's move this out of the way. The next step is to create a combine X, Y, Z node. After this, I will connect the vector into the X axis and the other one into the Y axis. And finally, we're gonna connect the vector into the offset. Now, what that does is that if I move the setting for the scale here, you can see I'm randomly moving the monkeys in the X axis and this one on the Y axis. So this way you can make some adjustments to make them more realistic. It's not just all perfectly aligned. You want some random, you want some noise in the placement of your characters. And we are done with the geometry node stuff. Now, where do we get these characters? Well, we use a software called Anima. It's a crowd generation software, and this is how I use it. So they already have some setups of people sitting and cheering and doing some monkey stuff, but I didn't want a scene with people so excited. I wanted something more just people standing up and uh, just moving, cheering a little bit so it's not too distracting. So I created my own crowd instead. So I drag the character there and every time you drag a character, if it doesn't have a path to follow, it's just standing by. And when it stands by, there's a lot of different settings that you can use to decide what it's going to do. So for example, this one here, if I press play, it's just doing like not much, but then I can go into the settings here and I can change what it's doing. Let's say standing another one here. So now it's doing another movement. So I just dragged and drop all the characters into the scenes and put them at different settings. And that's how I created all this crowd. I had like 120 characters in my scene. If you import the same character multiple times, you will see that they will have different colors for their clothes. Each character has four different color variations and you can pick them manually if you want to. Once you are done with your setup, you need to export them. There's a preset for Blender which exports in Colada, but doesn't work as well as exporting into FBX. So I use FBX. 
Once we import them into Blender, you can see that we have all the shaders that are connected. So the diffuse, the roughness, and the normal maps are all connected. If the bone seems to be in the wrong orientation, it's because you didn't turn on the automatic bone orientation uh, checkbox. So once you do this, everything will be just fine. Obviously, these characters are not designed to be seen in close-up. Now you may think that all you have to do is to put this collection instead of the monkeys and it's gonna work. Well, it won't. You're gonna get a lot of crap if you try this. You cannot use skin models, for that you need to use a Lambics. But that's a little bit tricky. Let me show you. So first you need to load the FBX and you want to make sure that you don't forget to turn on the automatic bone orientation. Now go in the hierarchy and select all the character's geometry. What you want to do at this point, and this is very important, is to go into Object, Menu, and Bake the Animation. And in the option for Bake, you're going to click everything except for Clean Curves, because we don't want to do this, it's going to mess up the animation. And we're going to take it out of the hierarchy. So once we do this, we can see that the characters are not parented to anything anymore. Now I can select all the characters, and I can export them into an Alembic. It's very important that you turn on Face Sets, otherwise your shaders will not work. If you create a new file and you import your Alembic, you will not have your shaders. It will not work. Here's the trick. Okay, so let me go back here. I'm going to turn off this collection so we see what we're doing. I'm going to import the Alembic and I get all my characters here. You can see that all the shaders have been applied automatically. And that's because I still had the original characters from the FBX. Now we can get rid of all the empties. We don't need them anymore. So now we can delete the entire collection that we had at the beginning, the one with all the skeletons and everything. So just select the collection and delete hierarchy. I'm going to place all these characters into a new collection. And finally, you're going to go into the file menu and go clean up recursive so you get rid of all the crap that you had in the scene. Here are a few potential issues you can run into. I made this very, very simple script here. It's just a collection that's plugged into the instance. And you can see the characters are all over the place. That's because when I exported the characters, they were not at the origin. They were all over the place like this. And this is something that I shouldn't have done. And even if I reset this to zero and copy all to selected, it's not going to change anything. So how can we fix it without having to re-export the Alembic? Well, if I go back to my script, I can click on reset children and now everything will be okay, except that all my characters are lying on their back. And that's because Anima is working Y up and Blender is working Z up. So what you need to do is go into your rotations and just change the rotation to 90 degrees and that will fix everything. But wait a minute, Blender Bob, you said we need to do all that stuff to align the characters to the empty. So if I do this, well, they're going to go flat again. Well, what you could do is to create a vector math node here, put it in add and just add something in the X rotation. So like I did right here. And for some reason, you need to put it at about 1.5, 1.4 to get them straight. I don't know why, where this number comes from, but eh, that's the way it is. And this is how I've been able to create the crowd for these three shots. Now it works well when it's far away and it's blurry, but what happens if you need a close-up of a crowd? Now it's a totally different game. Let me show you what's wrong with this technique. The basic anima characters are not designed to be seen from close, and you get some weird deformations here, and if you play the animation, it's kind of a, eh, you know, it works from far away, but doesn't look realistic, and there's no expression, no close deformation, oh, and now he's all sad. Come on, dude, you may be an ugly CG character, but you can still be happy. Yay! So an alternative to do this in order to fix all these problems is to use videogrammetry. But before we talk about videogrammetry, we need to talk about photogrammetry. Photogrammetry is where you have an object and take pictures of the subject from a lot of different angles. Put this in a computer, in a software, like for example Meshroom, which is free and open source, and it's going to recreate a 3D object, a 3D mesh, with the textures on it, and you can use it in any 3D package that you want. Now, videogrammetry does the same thing, but with moving people. So it records the video and does a 3D animated model instead. It's quite amazing. Now, I'm going to show you some videogrammetry captures that we did with our secret partner. I'm not going to tell you who we're working with for this stuff because, you know, we cannot share all our secrets. Uh, but I'm not allowed to show you their faces. That's because these are the employees of the company and, uh, you know, they're doing stuff like this and they, they don't want to be on the internet, you know, looking all goofy and everything. I'm Blender Bob. I don't care. I will look stupid. I don't care. You know, couldn't care less. You can fill a stadium full of people. I'm going to go in front and just be stupid. But hey, that's me. So yeah, I'm not going to show their faces. 
As opposed to motion capture, which only captures the position of the bones, this captures the performance of the actor. So you capture the hair, the cloth deformation, you capture everything. We also have the ability to add props to the characters, in this case a baseball cap and a hat. So you may think, well what's the big deal? Well the big deal is that with videogrammetry, the geometry changes pretty much every frame. So you cannot simply attach an object to a vertice because this vertice may not be there on the next frame. Now the big advantage of videogrammetry is that you can do whatever you want with the camera. You're not limited to seeing something from one angle or just, you know, a little bit of variation. No, no, no. You can do it full 360 degrees around your characters and it just works great. This is a test shot we did using videogrammetry. Even the guy on stage is full CG. The entire thing is all Blender. There's no way we could render this with GPU because it was too heavy, too many textures, too much stuff to handle. We don't have a graphic card with like 80 gigs of RAM. That doesn't exist unless you combine two cards together, which is not the case. And our render farm is CPU and that's one of the reasons why we use CPU for rendering because having 80 gigs of RAM for CPU, it's no big deal. On a graphic card, mm, much more complicated. Another big, big issue with videogrammetry is the motion blur. You cannot use vector blurs because there are too many objects moving in different directions. It doesn't look good. We try it. So it's really, really hard to find a system that does videogrammetry with motion blur. But with our secret partner, we've been able to fix that issue. Other issues that you can have with videogrammetry is that everything has to be like a diffuse shader. You cannot have, for example, a different shader on a leather jacket and it's one more specular on it than the face. You cannot do this because it keeps changing all the time. You cannot mask it. So that's one of the big drawbacks of using videogrammetry. When you get something that is properly lit and properly set up, you get something that's really, really convincing. So that's it for today. If you have other suggestions of VFX shots that you would like to know how it's been done and how it could be done in Blender, well, tell me in the comment, tell me, uh, give me a YouTube link with the time so I know exactly where to look and I will do my best to show it to you. All right, bye.